Great. Many thanks everyone for joining back after the lunch break. Uh, now we are back. And um, this is uh, just a reminder, this is day two of the free day event. Uh, tomorrow will be final day. So today we have this afternoon uh, one session and, and the session uh, called Energy Transition and Extractive Industries. And um, <clears throat> the session will be uh, moderated by Stephen Peters. Many thanks, St Stephen, to, for agreeing to moderate this session. Uh, Stephen Peters is a senior energy specialist at uh, Asian Development Bank, my colleague, and he specializes on waste to energy topic in energy sector group on sustainable development and climate change department. He's responsible for developing knowledge-based project development, implementation, waste to energy, uh, and supporting projects across waste and circular economy and ocean impacts. Uh, Stefan, many thanks, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dana. Am I coming through clear? Yeah, great. Terrific, thank you. Um, for our first session, first panel, uh, first paper, I should say, we're doing a panel uh, paper on facilitating energy transition through interconnection capacity expansion and the case of the Japanese electricity market. I'd like to hand over the floor to Lian Yok Dung, the research associate at ADB Japan. Uh, Lee Doc, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephen, and uh, thank you so much for organizing committee to providing me this opportunity to present my paper. Now let me share my presentation. Uh, yes, um, thank you so much. And my paper title is Facilitating the Energy Transition Through Interconnection Capacity Expansion and take the case of Japanese um, wholesale electricity market. This paper is written with my co-author is Professor Ohashi from the University of Tokyo. And now um, I'm presented um, the, at this uh, conference. So, uh, and discuss, uh, this paper also will be discussed um, by Mr. Keichi Tamaki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keichi Tamaki in advance. So um, this is the content of my presentation. Um, there are several parts I may, uh, because the time is constrained. So maybe I need to go quickly go through it, um, but um, I happy to, to, to receive any questions or clarification in the Q&A section. Um, for the introduction, firstly, for motivation of this uh, paper, um, you may already know that infrastructure play a very critical role uh, for the electricity reforming, and um, Japan is one of the countries have to face the challenges. Um, the benefits of expanding connection have many. For example, they facilitate for um, for the active trading between uh, locations, and um, increase the competitiveness of um, the electricity market, and also pave the way for uh, the adoption of renewables energy. For example, so in their pen, um, the government recognized this issue and they try to to solve the problem. And recently, they uh, decided to expand um, the capacity of the tie light uh, between and among a reason. And one of them is be between Hokkaido and Tohoku. You can see the right hand side picture. Um, that is the tie light between Hokkaido and Tohoku uh, increased from 600 megawatt hour to 9. 100 megawatt hours in March 2019. That's why I want to take these opportunities to um, to approve um, the test uh, hypothesis of that benefits of interconnection uh, expansion in capacity, and uh, to test how about um, the market integration in the pennies uh, wholesale electricity market has a benefit from this expansion. That's why the major research question is, what is the effect of connection capacity expansion on the market integration in the case of the pen through uh, several um, indicators for market integration, for example, the prior conversion or activities in arbitrage trading. So, the methodology we deploy uh, for the research have a qualitative and quantitative ones. <laughs> for, uh, qualitative, uh, we try to um, 
to create uh, the figures or decide for uh, the data analysis um, for the from the at the table with the the that uh, such statistical uh, significant uh, to move to the modeling part for the quantitative uh, quantitative um, analysis. We deploy two types um, of regression model here. It's a sensor regression model, it's a spatial type of top regression model, and dummy variable regression model. So let me turn to for the review on the prior conversion in relation with the market integration, competition, and welfare benefit. Basically, um, with the welfare impact um, and the benefits from the interconnectors. Um, Coming from is allowed for additional electricity value is traded uh, through lower um, electricity generators uh, location to higher cost of electricity uh, electricity generator location. It means that um, the price is become more conversion, and the quality exchange is um, added. So have several. Um, studies attempt to to uh, prove this hypothesis. Um, most of them coming from the European Union's location and the North America. Um, and for the market integration and strategic withholding is the problem of um, of the competition issue. So um, without the proper capacity of interconnectors or let's say how about the separate location is highly likely that uh, the market player wind practice um, the market powers for example um, strategic uh, withholding they will try to withhold a part of the quality uh, necessary quality to make sure that they can increase the price of electricity they can trade it and then maximum their profit. We cannot compare with the case of supply under the perfect competition, but at least uh, when you allow for more electricity traded, um, when have expanded um, the interconnected capacity, it will uh, decrease the problem of market power practice. And this also the benefit uh, of the expansion um, of the Tyler capacity. So let me move to for the Japanese wholesale market with the status of market integration to prior differences. The, the left hand side um, is um, the figure to show the amount of electricity sale in ZEPX uh, and retailers. Uh, there are two important regulations uh, taking into place in 2017 and 2018 in their pen is a gross bidding and implicit uh, auctioning. Before this regulation taken into place, um, the liquidity of the EPX, um, that electricity trading over uh, the trend is very limited. It's negligible with only 2%. But um, partly thanks to the regulation change, um, the liquidity is improved significantly. And for example, in 2021, over 40% of the retail um, of electricity sales um, that traded in the EPX. This is kind of benefit of the reforming based on the regulation change and adoption. But the problem still um, happened in the case of a splitting rate or the price uh, of different location in their pen. Of, uh, it means that in their pen, we don't have often have a uniform price there than we have an error price or not no price. Only 5% of their head spot price in 2019, for example, did not divide up market price. They have a price gap between the location and errors in their pen. And one of, re, of, of the problem is we lacking of the capacity, the proper capacity of the tie line. So let me move to a distributed data analysis and regression model with testing and outcome. For data sample and construction in the paper, we collect the, the data for two year period from March 2018 to February 2020. 
and containing 17,544 hourly price of Hokkaido and Tohoku. So we have a March 2019 here is that event where interconnection capacity expansion taken into place with 300 uh, megawatt hour added. And also we take the data um, from the public source list from the EPX website and also the Genco here. We have a Hokkaido Genco and Tohoku Genco here. Uh, quite luckily when you have gathered the public data um, from these sources. And this is the value of electricity trading uh, before and after period, uh, before the capacity expansion, and this is after the capacity expansion. Uh, from visualization, you can see that we have significant increase in total amount of electricity traded uh, between, sorry, between two locations. And with exact value of 2.3 times higher when we compare for after value with the before value. And the right hand side here, we attempt to use the R package to see the value in chart here with the total value after period. Uh, you can see it kind of look like return. Right? So for the maximum value, this is the import value of Tohoku from Hokkaido. And this is exit 600 megawatt hours. So it's a very good sign that the capacity expansion has the benefits on the additional trading of the electricity market within the reason. And the mean and medium here, you can see that um, the mean value and medium value of the trading also increased. So this is the, the major statistic um, in different criteria of the hourly prices and power flow from before and after period. This year, electricity prior to Toku, for example, is the before and this year after. For um, this is a huge difference when compared to two data. And this is very small data is close to zero. This very low price indeed. And it's highly likely that this price coming from renewable energy. Because um, please note that the Japan adopt merit order of dispatch for electricity. Um, so, for example, renewable should be dispatched first because they have a lowest marginal cost of electricity generation compared, and then uh, hydro, and then nuclear power, and then thermal power, for example. So, a very good sign to see that with the additional. Um, capacity expansion allow for renewable energy have an opportunity to be traded. And for price gap, you see a significant difference also. Um, so for market integration indicators, you have a two um, indicators um, measure is the price conversion rate and also utilization rate and two criteria um, have um, enhanced when we compare to after and before period. And now let me to move to the empirical estimation and result. And um, firstly is estimation of effect of price gaps on electricity trading by employing sensor regression model. And then I want to see the effect of expanded time like capacity on market integration through a dummy variable regression model. So, um, when we want to see how about the different in price impact to the trading, and in this case, in the import uh, of Hokkaido from Tohoku, we cannot use the normal regression model because we have kind of the limit in both uh, threshold and the floor. For example, import cannot negative, it must be equal to zero or larger than zero. And there are, for the limit higher, we cannot exceed um, this capacity, maximum capacity. So we, we try to use the same regression model here and to see how about um, the price gap impact to the import value of um, Toku and Hokkaido. And this is the, the findings of the regression models we use our package. So all of the core efficient here is um, statistically significant with 99% of confidence level. 
And for the prior gap uh, negative value, it means that the value is um, increased when you increase up one uh, yen per kilowatt hour, we make the import value decrease about four megawatt hours. For the second uh, regression model, we, we try to add more explanatory variable here with area demand, and we ask for dummy variable. Dummy variable, if equal to one, is in the uptake root, and equal to zero is in the before root. And then we, we contract the, the regression like this. This is the finding of that. For dummy variable, uh, this is significant statically with 99% confident, uh, confident um, level. And the value here means that when um, the import value for Hokkaido and Toku can increase by 134 megawatt hours, um, maybe thanks to if we, we remain all of this variable constant. So for the conclusion with the paper limitation, um, this paper we try to uh, provide the empirical opportunity to test for hypothesis on the benefit interconnection economics. And um, we also attempt to try to help uh, for the cost benefit analysis um, in the future. In the Lenoc, you're gonna have to finish up, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, thank you. So we have the current rate here increase and the interconnection expansion is also more attract, uh, active trading. So for limitation here, we have a three limitation and may be used for further study if uh, we have opportunity to access more uh, data um, available, uh, not publicly, but can find the sources to solve it. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much uh, for your listening and I'm happy to receive your feedback. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lenok. That was a great paper. Very, very useful. And uh, it was a great case study. Well done. Um, just to give you a bit of background, uh, Lenok uh, previously was the fac with the Faculty of International Finance at the Academy of Finance and the Ministry of Finance in Hanoi. Uh, she has degrees from postgraduate degrees from Monash University and the University of Tokyo, and she's done work with USAID. Um, to discuss her paper, I have great uh, pleasure in introducing Keichi Tamaki. Uh, Tamaki-san uh, has 40 years of experience in urban development, including a stint with ADB and JBIG and uh, the World Bank, starting at World Bank, and uh, he's a very experienced professional. Uh, so Tamaki-san, I hold the, floor, hold the floor to you. Okay, um, thanks, Mr. Peters. And uh, thanks for uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Dan for uh, giving me the opportunity to review this very interesting paper. And so let me um, comment, not only comment, but also supplement a little bit because uh, um, many audience may not know uh, Japanese context very well. So uh, let me start by saying this. Um, well, given the existential imperative to shift from fossil fuel based power generation to renewable power generation, the subject matter covered by this paper is very relevant and timely. And at the same time, paper also analyzes the pursuit of cost effectiveness through reformed, deregulated um, energy market. Um, well, Japan um, started uh, this de deregulation process uh, since 2013. Um, they are shifting it gradually uh, from uh, 2013. And the deregulated energy market gradually de uh, departing from the vertically integrated, regionally monopolized power utility. Um, as she already showed, um, there are 10 in Japan. And that um, which is um, also very timely and uh, relevant. And the paper reaffirms arbitrage theory that price gap is driving force of the electricity trading between two areas. So that's uh, already uh, proved by the paper. Oops, next. And this is uh, what uh, Ms. Dan already showed, but uh, overlapping the uh, map. 
And as you can see, uh, there are 10, but uh, Okinawa is uh, too far away uh, to the south. And that uh, the other nine are on the four main islands of Japan. And that um, they are already interconnected. And that um, because there are either um, bridge or tunnel or both connecting these four islands. And that, um, next, and this is uh, what the Ms. Dan already indicated. Um, Japan has a kind of uh, historical baggage of uh, dual uh, well, electric AC cycle. And that's because uh, back in the 19th century, um, the Eastern part, basically Tokyo, imported the generator from Germany, whereas the uh, um, Western part, that is mainly Osaka, imported generators from US. So that's the reason why there are two different uh, cycles um, in Japan. And uh, methodology, results, and discussion. Um, well, as an economist, um, you cannot afford to miss the opportunity to use the data before and after a discrete change. In this case, uh, an expansion of interconnection capacity. And uh, uh, this is uh, called Hoku Hon interconnection. Hoku means Hokkaido, Hon means Honshu. So Hoku Hon is an abbreviation of this interconnection uh, line. And uh, it was uh, uh, before it was 600 megawatt. And that, uh, that's, uh, um, the data is from March 2018 to February 2019. And then um, after the inauguration of this augmented uh, line, it became 900 megawatt. Um, and the data is available from March 2019 to February 2020. And that, um, as she already mentioned, uh, this uh, electricity trading is uh, happening in the day ahead spot market on JEPX, that is the Japanese uh, electricity exchange market. And that, um, that change actually happened gross bidding uh, that uh, uh, one of the delegation uh, attempt that was launched back in April 1, 2017. And that there's another attempt of implicit auctioning that was launched on October 1, 2018. And uh, that's uh, encouraging cross-regional trade. So that um, discrete change happened uh, after these two uh, derogation um, attempts were already completed. And uh, um, as uh, I explained in the day one session, um, Japan is a statistical data paradise. You know, um, many uh, data is uh, publicly available. And that uh, um, Organization for, uh, for Cross-Regional Coordination of Transmission Operator, that's the uh, uh, abbreviation is OCTA, that provides demand and supply of uh, electricity by generation type. And that uh, data is available throughout the year hourly. And that another one is a price, that's uh, Japan electricity power exchange uh, that short is JPX, that's she already mentioned. And uh, that's the market price of uh, uh, the power. And uh, uh, that's uh, every half hour um, available, uh, every half hour. And that uh, two sets of data were aligned in terms of uh, their frequency. I mean, basically, you have to convert the JPX data into hourly because it's too fine. I mean, uh, aligning to hourly. And the data, uh, so the data um, she analyzed basically supports predicted result of change, which is more cross-regional trading 
and smaller cross-regional price difference. So in other words, market integration actually took place. And uh, uh, although it is difficult to quantify, augmentation of interconnection capacity is obviously good for ensuring supply, reliability, and resilience. But because uh, uh, Hokkaido had an earthquake, um, and uh, they had a big blackout. Um, and uh, that's uh, also um, well, came up uh, in the people's mind. You know, this is something you know, really necessary. And uh, uh, recommendation and policy implication. Um, power generation, which used to be done mainly at the controllable conventional power plant, you know, thermal power plant, is now increasingly performed intermittently at different scattered location. So grid and transmission line, including interconnection infrastructure, need to be reformulated or, or and or expanded. And the conclusion interconnection improvement to facilitate electricity flows across area is crucial for market reform and transition from fossil fuel to renewable is justified. And that, um, but cost benefit analysis of such investment would then be, well, deserve further research. I mean, um, how much does it cost to do this augmentation? And uh, does it worth it? I mean, that's uh, probably the next uh, you know, research topic um, she may want to pursue. And that uh, um, consequence of anyone uh, in the connection uh, scheme, I mean, that's mentioned in the uh, paper, but uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, analyzed yet. So connect and manage model uh, is also a uh, further research topic uh, she may want to pursue. And that um, when you want to do something uh, you know, more, then uh, in the case of Japan, I mean, Kyushu, that is a uh, southern island, is a uh, very interesting place to look into because uh, there's uh, something called uh, um, photovoltaic output suppression is happening. I mean, there are um, days when um, over capacity from uh, uh, solar power is uh, need to be suppressed uh, because uh, um, in order to balance out the uh, uh, demand and supply. So yeah. that's uh, more or less what I have to say. Oh, sorry. You're going to have to <laughs> yeah. finish up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Tamaki san. Um, no, thank, okay. you, thank you very much. I, I, a great line statistical data paradise. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard that about Japan before. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> It's a great, it's a great line. Um, in the interim of having questions uh, from so let's everybody, use this one. No, although I, can, I will not be comfortable using yeah. this one. And I have Hi, a, could I ask that person to turn off? Hi, whoever's talking, could I ask you to mute yourself, please? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll have to. Yeah. Hi. Um, so. Uh, Going on from that question about a, uh, the comment about being a statistical data paradise, um, I was just wanting to pose a question to the discussant and the presenter about the implications of using digitization to better provide better, well, use some of that fantastic granularity and also drive whether that could drive convergence on price. And I, the, the paper is very interesting because it, it, it sort of says that we have these pathways to decarbonize and introduce more renewables. Um, and you're showing how it's being done. So I find it very practical. So perhaps, um, Ms. Dung, I'll ask you to answer that question first, perhaps, if you've got a query or a comment on that. Yeah, first of all, uh, let me thank you, Mr. Keiichi Tamaki, uh, to uh, provide very valuable, valuable feedback to our um, paper. And yeah, I'm sure to, to uh, take into the consideration for prepare the next step of our further study and also revise my paper regarding your feedback. Yeah, uh, for the question from the meter Stephen regarding um, the prior conversion. And um, 
I also mentioned in my paper that um, the prior difference uh, this or prior conversion had a problem for the electricity market in their pain. I uh, actually have many regulations to tackle this problem, but it should be uh, need to further um, reforming based on that. Um, and one of them is a the problem of like of the capacity of interconnectors. And that's why this is also the motivation of our our paper for sort of a prior conversion uh, because um, it brings a lot of benefits uh, for um, um, for 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 the market to see how about it uh, to reform from less competitive to more competitive market based on these indicators. And for integration of market is also play very important role to reduce the problem of market powers. When you have the lack of price conversion, it means that um, the price difference um, is significant in, in many location. And it means that it's highly likely the market power is practiced in many locations as well. So um, in my paper, I also talk um, some part about uh, how the market player, particularly for electricity generator, they use the strategic holding withholds uh, the necessary part of the quality that should be traded, but uh, they they withhold that to increase the price is traded and maximize the profit. So, um, yeah, we, we need to 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 base on the price conversion and market integration for for the research and for cost benefits as well from the feedback from the, um, the middle Tamaki about the cost benefit um, analysis as our upcoming research. Actually, we, we are still looking for the cost data. It's mm. not really the, the, the pen is the paradise for the data. Um, in some cases, for example, when I'm looking for the cost of how about uh, generation cost in some um, electricity source, for example, thermal power, coal power plant, it's not really publicly. So uh, it's quite hard for us to run this cost benefit analysis. Uh, in um, a proper way and in a convincing uh, to file convincing findings um, because we need to as assume many many have make a lot of assumption um, you can like update it so I, I would like to ask um, Mr. Keiichi Tamaki regarding this as well how can I find this cost um, data because I'm, I'm looking for for the website publicly but um, it should be kind of the confidential database. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for the question and, and good luck to see your feedback as well. Thank you. Yeah, my turn. Please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I think it, um, the cost uh, is mainly about infrastructure, not the uh, generator side. I mean, like a grid and a, a link. I mean, that's what you really have to look into. I mean, um, generator size, that's an IPP, you know, will try to do, you know, as much as uh, you know they can. So you don't need to worry too much about it. So uh, what you have to look into is a grid link. And that um, this, uh, you know, data availability, uh, abundant data, and that's uh, uh, what you can use for demand management. I mean, that's what the, uh, I and the Sakai-san did the training session uh, in day one. And that um, there are lots of opportunity, like uh, uh, with a big consumer, like an electric furnace, uh, you know, steel, uh, you know, producers. I mean, that's already happening in Kyushu. I mean, they shifted the midnight operation to daytime because there are abundant excess power from uh, uh, solar power um, in Kyushu. And uh, that's a uh, very big deal. And uh, that's a big one, but also um, household, each household can do, you know, like uh, changing the time of the laundry and the drying. And that's also uh, help a lot. I mean, if uh, many people start doing that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tamaki-san. Um, are there any questions from the floor or do I get a chance to ask another question? Would anyone like to raise their hand with a question? Okay, while we're waiting for that, um, one of the things I wanted to pose a question to both of you is um, offshore wind, 
um, is increasing in popularity in Japan and also the use of batteries. I note that Sapporo has a very large flow battery. Um, I'm wondering how those will Im impact the, the assessment that was done and whether that could be a source of new work or whether that was in included somehow. Mrs. Dunn? Can I answer the question first? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, this is actually that I would like to uh, deep tie for the for the research. And this, is, I think, is very relevant with our research as well. When um, the findings um, as up, up up now is only to see how about additional electricity traded uh, over the tie line between two reasons. But I want to deep dive on how about additional renewable energy can be traded thanks to the expansion of tile capacity as well. And particularly because Hokkaido and Tohoku are both location have a huge potential for renewable energy. Mm. Um, and um, as one thing I mentioned in my presentation is that after the expansion of the uh, tile capacity, we can see that in sometimes the price of Tohoku, um, the prior electricity very low is 0 0.5 yen per kilowatt hours. It means that this highly likely, this is price of electricity thanks to the renewable energy can be traded because mm -hmm. they can adopt the merits of orders for dispatching uh, the electricity. So we marginal cost of renewable should be very low compared to the thermal power like coal, um, like uh, um, fossil fuel and other kind of thermal power as well. So yeah, for, for, for off offshore wind is kind of renewable energy. And I expected that I can deep dive further for research to see how about renewable energy then uh, can generate it thanks to this expansion. Yeah, well, unfortunately, you know, wind uh, power um, Japan fell behind uh, while uh, Europe, uh, you know, went ahead, you know, in big time. So I hope uh, Japan also uh, try to catch up with uh, uh, wind power um, generation offshore in particular. And that um, the price of uh, renewable, I think um, basically they are doing, you know, dispatching order. Um, basically, you know, where um, solar power is uh, very uh, readily available, it becomes uh, uh, zero cost. So that is the first uh, power source that the utility start using. Um, so that's already in order. But uh, again, you know, um, user side, I mean, demand side management mm -hmm. is necessary to mm -hmm. uh, absorb, you know, those, uh, you know, excess capacity. Otherwise, uh, it gets lost. I mean, uh, that is already happening in Kyushu. So that's a challenge. So I think we're going to run out of time. I don't think we have time for another question, but I, I wanted to thank uh, Mrs. Dung for fighting the good fight and doing the research on something that's terribly important. And to Maki san for your color and your um, detail on answering the questions was very, very helpful. So um, that's a great start to this panel. So th this session. So oh, yeah. thank you so much. So yeah, um, thank you. Um, so the next uh, speakers I'd like to call on um, is Professor Bhagirath Behra, uh, who's a professor of environmental research, of environmental and resource economics at uh, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kharagpur in India. Um, Professor Bhagirath is going to talk to us about decarbonizing energy systems in India, and it's going to provide a critical assessment of the performance of the National Clean Energy Environment Fund, NCEF. Um, so, sir, I hand over to you, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, is my slides visible? Yes, they are. Sure. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank ADBI for giving me this opportunity to uh, present our paper and uh, which is titled as Decarbonizing Energy System in India, a Critical Assessment of the Performance of National Clean Energy and Environmental Fund. And uh, this is our outline of uh, you know, the presentations. And uh, so coming straight to this uh, point that uh, you know, uh, 
the National Clean Energy and Environment Fund was constituted in the year 2010. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, uh, it was done through an implicit carbon tax levied on coal, heat, and uh, lignite, uh, which is produced domestically as well as imported uh, from outside and uh, which is based on a polluters based principle. And the objective of the fund was to invest in research and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, and uh, innovative and, uh, you know, entrepreneurial projects partnering to clean energy uh, in India. And uh, the objective of this paper is to basically analyze uh, or rather critically analyze the performance of NCF between the year 2010 and 2017 and identify key limitations in its working. And uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I mean, the question is basically how did these uh, funds mobilized and how the funds are actually spent on different projects. Uh, so as you can see that the projects are basically screened through an inter-ministerial group uh, chaired by the finance secretary. And uh, so the, the projects could be, you know, submitted by any persons, organizations or their group in either a public or, uh, or private sector. And these are some of these, you know, broad list of eligible projects where the funds can be utilized or invested. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so, <clears throat> so there are, this is uh, the timeline um, of uh, the, the evolutions of- uh, Professor uh, Bhagirath, I don't think we're seeing the transitions for your slides. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing so seeing the sorry. first slide, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, now I can see it. Yep. Now we can see timeline and key changes for NCEF. Is that yes, correct slide? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Is, is my slides moving? Um, that they weren't before, but I'll just, uh, yeah, just I'll I'll uh, I'll let you know when the next slide changes. Okay. Just one second. Let me just try. There's some issues. No there. problem. Thank you. Yeah, is it is my slides are visible? Yes, they are now. Yes, they are now. Yeah, great. And I hope the slides are moving. Yes, they are. Good, good. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is the you know the change in uh, the structure of the NCCF from the year 2010. As you can see that. Uh, it was established in 2010 uh, with uh, the clean energy sales of Indian rupees 50 per ton, and uh, which is you know expanded uh, to include clean environment initiative in 2014, and then also the uh, the sales was also hiked to 100 rupees uh, you know per ton, and in 2015 and uh, that was again hiked to 200 per ton, and uh, in 2016 the clean energy sales modified into clean environment sales. And uh, an increase to, to uh, 400 per ton, and it was renamed uh, from clean, National Clean Energy Fund uh, to National Clean and uh, Environmental Fund. And uh, so, uh, so in, in essence, uh, in 2017, the NCCF was abolished, and the clean environmental says, along with several other says and taxes, combined to you know to form a goods and service compensation fund. And so, and so, if you look at uh, you know the um, uh, you know the um, the theories in support of such kind of you know uh, scheme, we basically uh, come across two important theories that is Hartwig uh, you know rules and uh, and also the Hermann-Dalys principle. So Hartwig basically assumes the substitutability between natural and uh, you know physical capital. Which is, you know, uh, uh, termed as weak sustainability, and there basically he argues that, you know, rent from existing resources should be invested in development and uh, of technology to ensure that a constant level of consumptions can be, you know, maintained indefinitely. And uh, whereas Dalis assumes a complementarity between uh, natural and physical capital, non-renewable resources should be exploited. Uh, and uh, you know, at a rate equal to the creations of uh, you know um, uh, their uh, renewable energy, and uh, so there are these. Uh, uh, just one second, some have some problem. Um, 
Yes, so the other theories of uh, and, and frameworks have uh, approached uh, categorizations and use of adjustable resources and, and ultimately reinforce the idea that range from fossil fuel should be reinvested to develop their you know, renewable substitute. And uh, so <clears throat> in terms of you know, uh, carbon uh, tax in, in, uh, you know, in, in practice, and we see that several studies which basically shows that the carbon tax is usually associated with economic and welfare losses and, and the utilization of the revenue needs to be, uh, you know, um, uh, carefully uh, considered. So international studies also, uh, you know, uh, shows uh, for developed countries that, which basically that shows that the public acceptance of carbon tax tend to increase when the revenue is used for transition to green energy. Uh, and uh, so in the context of India's, the study shows that the fears of economic and welfare loss due to carbon tax may be exaggerated and revenue recycling mechanism can help mitigate this loss. And uh, so uh, in terms of carbon tax and, uh, 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 and innovations, we, we see that, uh, you know, uh, most studies agrees uh, that, um, just one second, uh, agrees that the, you know, um, the carbon tax is generally considered to be a strong fiscal measures to reduce, uh, you know, emissions, but there is still consensus on magnitude of carbon tax and the utilization of the revenue generated thereof. So there are studies which, which also shows that the carbon tax is usually associated with economic and welfare loss. And, um, and uh, so, um, so uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of innovations, which is basically, you know, shows that the, uh, the most studies agree that the carbon tax alone is not sufficient for, you know, innovations to take place. And uh, so green energy technology are also emerging. They do not have, you know, uh, market uh, uh, su uh, support to, you know, uh, to establish uh, and uh, which also, uh, you know, uh, needed declared measures for their diffusions. And uh, so, uh, we can say that such measures can also include innovation subsidies, direct public participations, uh, productions linked to incentive and, and other subsidies. And so uh, what are the learnings that we can have from other countries? We studied from you know, different schemes from Thailand, Canada, Australia, California, and US and Malaysian Electricity uh, Supply uh, Board. And what we basically see is that there are a lot of dissimilarities, but their working mechanism offer very interesting insight. And those insights basically, you know, in terms of the managing committee, in terms of investment strategies, and also the investment tools. And uh, so here, basically, we our job is basically to understand that what are the things that we can learn from this, the formations of NCCF, and then try and review their performance. And so here, basically, the fund positions of NCCA, uh, you can see that uh, the total collections between 2010 and 11 and uh, 2018 and 19 uh, was around 10.11 billion. And only 45% 45, 45 of this amount uh, uh, you know, was uh, transferred to NCCF. And uh, only 54% uh, you know, of this amount uh, that was transferred was used to finance relevant projects. So in essence, only 24% of the total collections was utilized. And uh, so, so in terms of you know, different uh, you know, spending pattern, we, we observed that before 2014, most of the fund was spent on projects partnering to energy. And after 2014, the share of environmental projects started increasing and went up to 41% of the total uh, fund utilized. And uh, so in terms of, you know, utilization of fund, we could see that there are a lot of these funds have been used as a kind of extra budgetary corpus. And, uh, and uh, some of the, uh, you know, funds were basically, uh, you know, uh, spent by the uh, different ministries, especially the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And, um, and uh, then also the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change on their different projects. And so our main, uh, you know, uh, uh, Issue. I mean, basically, the uh, objective of our project is basically to evaluate the scheme uh, in the light of project funded under NCCF and the policy itself. So you can see that in this table, um, the most of the projects funded till April 2015 
were related to renewable energy technology, especially you know solar technology, and uh, um, so um, and also there are different uh, projects. You know, if you look at from the lens of project eligibility, the different ministries have different you know uh, uh, projects funded through this uh, uh, you know uh, the scheme, and. Uh, so here again, if you look at from the governance, uh, sorry, innovations lens, none of the projects uh, that uh, we see uh, had any value from the perspective of innovations. Barring two projects between 2011, 13, uh, 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 none of the projects catered to pilots or demonstrations aiming at commercializations of clean energy technologies. Barring one project in 2011 and 12, none of the projects catered to uh, you know, um, uh, due to research and development for technology that would help uh, with clean uh, climate. And uh, uh, all the, you know, energy projects could be categorized as what we call direct public participations because they dealt with installations of solar energy technology through public funding. And uh, so such as installations of solar you know, uh, photovoltaic plants of carrying capacity across various states, uh, installations of solar pumps uh, for agriculture. And uh, so instead of stimulating innovation, the fund was used as an extra budgetary corpus to, uh, to plant budgetary activities. And uh, so if you look at this scheme uh, in, in, in light of you know, uh, governance, uh, we see that the, in terms of managing committee, NCCF worked through an interministerial group, uh, which consisted primarily of bureaucrats while there was provisions for inclusions of topic experts, but it was never ex exercised. So in terms of eligibility parties, uh, when the projects could be submitted by any public or private individual or corporations, it had to be rooted through a ministry which hampered you know, independent private participations. And uh, uh, to, I mean, uh, in terms of investment strategies, so NCCF, uh, for provided viability gap funding up to 40% of the total project cost and laid additional constraints regarding where the uh, rest of the funding could be you know, uh, mobilized or obtained from. And uh, so, so only one investment tool that is viability gap fund funding was basically is observed. Other features, there, are, there was no clear directions on how to promote transparency, accountability or conduct evaluations of the investment. And so in terms of evaluations, uh, we see that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we say that, you know, uh, a policy like NCCF that intends to stimulate decarbonization of the energy systems, which needs to have three characteristics. One is that it should prevent the growth of carbon intensive technology, but clean energy environmental says was aimed at reducing the growth of, you know, coal consumptions. However, the increasing demand for energy in India outpace any reductions in coal consumption emanating from SES. Second is should stimulate innovations in green technology by encouraging research, development, demonstrations, and deployment of this technology. However, the NCCA was barely used for RDD and D of these technologies. Instead, it was uh, used uh, you know, for installations of already existing technologies. Several projects had zero value from an innovative standpoint. And the third is should incentivize the diffusion of such technology through appropriate demand side innovations. The fund was used for installing technology related to solar energy, while these technologies were already available. And so these are some of these, you know, look at evaluations. So in terms of discussions, of course, this implicit carbon tax on coal currently stands at 400 rupees per ton. And the rate of, rate of growth of energy demand is high in India due to which such a small tax has little perceptible effect on coal consumption. Recent years have witnessed a very strong growth in solar energy, which was possibly due to several government interventions to mobilize private in investment in the sector. So the framework of the policies was both weak and inconsistent with emerged as a kind of uh, you know, major drawbacks of uh, NCCF. Scope of the fund was too broad, Funding limit was both arbitrary and regressive. Application mechanism through government ministries. Professor Bhagiri Rath, I'm going to have to ask you to finish up. Sure, sure. I'm just uh, closing in. And research and development was largely ignored with, uh, you know, implementing NCCF. 
and the inter interministerial group is in charge of dispersing the fund comprised only of bureaucrats from relevant ministries. So in conclusion, basically, you know, um, uh, we, we already, I, I mean, summarized that. Um, so, uh, so policy implications in terms of studies. Professor so Bakri Ratham, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to shut you down. Oh, my apologies, sir. But uh, sure, sure. We've okay, got to keep fine. time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, I read your, I read the presentation and your uh, deck. It was very interesting. Um, to have a dis as a discussant for this pol uh, paper, we have a very distinguished uh, professor from the Asian Institute of Techno uh, Technology in Thailand, Professor Deepak Sharma. Professor Sharma has a fairly stellar record both at UTS and uh, where he is a uh, emeritus professor. He also an emeritus, uh, also current board member of Prosper.net, which is at the United Nations University. Uh, professor Sharma, I'll hand it over to you, sir. Could you unmute, Professor? We, you're currently on mute. So, okay. Thank yeah, you. My yeah. apologies. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thank you, Professor Behra, for your interesting and informative presentation. And I commend you and your colleagues of, uh, for developing the paper. I read your paper and listened to your presentation with interest and I feel privileged to provide some comments on it. I'm structuring my comments broadly in terms of these titles, starting with your focus, your my overall opinion on the paper, the methodology that you've used, some comments on the results and reflection, and how to augment its policy significance. Let me begin the, uh, with the focus. Your paper essentially focuses on analyzing ex post the efficacy of the key past policy of the Indian government, namely National Clean Energy and Environmental Fund, acronymed NCEEF, over the period 2010 to 2017. This policy aimed to encourage the transition of the Indian economy or Indian energy sector more specifically to a clean energy future by one, dissuading the use of coal and two, promoting green energy innovations and the uptake of clean energy technologies through a carbon levy initially fixed at 50 rupees per ton of coal and later raised to 400 rupees per ton of coal. Uh, your paper argues that notwithstanding the merits of the policy, the policy has been a failure and it identifies some reasons for the failure. And finally, the paper recommends or finally, the paper expresses its faith in the basic soundness of the policy and recommends uh, its reinstatement in an amended form. Uh, it's my considered view that your paper addresses an issue of utmost contemporary significance, namely transition to a clean energy future. The significance of this issue gets enhanced when viewed from the context of a major carbon intensive economy like India. This paper, in my view, is well researched. You have painstakingly explained various aspects covered in your paper and uh, provided con convincing reasoning for your arguments. The paper, especially the recommendations you make to improve the NCEEP are generally founded on sound propositions. Uh, and it's my view that through the paper, you have established a useful platform to develop further ideas beyond the NCEEP scheme itself to progress the debate on, on, on this topic. Now, in terms of methodology, given the nature of the topic, um, your paper quite appropriately, in my view, adopts what can somewhat loosely be called a case study approach underscored by strong qualitative, descriptive, and inferential dispositions. As is common for case study uh, papers uh, like yours, much of the supporting data and information is sourced from, uh, from the literature and from secondary sources. Various stands of the arguments are founded on by taking recourse to underlying theories, for example, economic theories dealing with the efficacy of carbon taxes in promoting clean energy transition and experience both in India and elsewhere. In short, your methodology is appropriate 
and well applied. Um, and, and as a consequence, the results and the conclusions about the efficacy uh, uh, of the NCEEF policy are well supported, both from theoretical and experiential or practical considerations. Further, you have um, quite clearly articulated the results and the conclusions in your paper. Now, with um, so overall, it's a good contribution, very useful paper and a timely paper to debate this issue. Um, let me now, with humility, offer some comments that you and your colleagues may like to reflect on in order to augment the policy significance of your work. It's my view that the reasons forwarded in the paper for the failure of NCEEF policy are somewhat narrow in scope. Let me elaborate. For example, the paper exclusively points the accusative finger at the government for the failure of the policy. Some of the main reasons cited in the paper as being responsible for the failure include the scope of the policy was not properly defined um, and, and new elements were added to the policy after the policy had, uh, had started to be implemented, that there were too much ministerial in interference and that the revenue from the scheme was, um, uh, was appropriated or misappropriated um, by the government to fix its budgetary problems and so on. While all these reasons have an element of truth about them, not denying that. But one can always, one can also ask what's new about it. The government's world over interfered with the policy settings. And that's the how, how the governments work. So why then simply blame the government for the failure of the policy? That's a question that crossed my mind. Instead, the policy design process should show a more nuanced understanding of the underlying political processes and the design and design policies accordingly. And any major policy like NCCF was always going to create tectonic shifts, the ramifications of which were going to be felt much beyond the confines of the energy and the coal sectors, right through socio-political domains affecting jobs, cost of living, wage levels, employment, trade, and so on and so forth. This means that the that this policy and any major policy for that matter that affects the interest of a multitude of uh, people. Um, sorry. Multitude of people requires good assessment of the impacts of policy on wider cross section of society before the policy um, is designed. So many, if not most policies, including the one under discussion in your paper, however, remain, in my view, aloof from or somewhat dismissive of the political shenanigans, which are typical, um, typical in any policy making process. And instead, it puts all the blame for the failure on the government. Um, this, this is what creates a bit of anomaly in my view, in the sense that it ends up attributing the reasons for failure to sources, which are far removed from the sources where remedies to improve the outcomes are sought. From this perspective, it may be worthwhile to have some discussion in the paper that alludes to the underlying complexities of policy making processes and the significance of context, rather than exclusively attributing the failure of the policy to the failure of the government and so on. This will certainly um, rebalance uh, various arguments in your paper and augment its policy interest and policy significance. There are several frameworks available for this purpose, and they belong to political economy and institutional domains, which I'm sure you're very, uh, very familiar with. Um, let me also add that um, one 
I, I'm not at all suggesting that you have to take a full-blown analysis of these uh, aspects, uh, recourse to uh, political economy and institutional frameworks and so on, but some discussion in the paper on the significance of institutional and policy context will be uh, useful especially what additional information is required from these perspectives to design a policy and then hence seek its assessment of, on its performance and so on. So overall, a great effort and a very useful contribution to, a contribution to the debate on the topic of, um, of immense significance. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments on it. Thank you, that's all from me, thanks. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Um, very much appreciate your uh, review of the paper and your comments. And uh, Professor Bhagirath Bera, thank you very much for your comments as well. Uh, obviously, uh, when we get into the realm of politics, uh, life becomes very, very difficult for us who have to live at the coalface, pun intended. So um, I, I was, there aren't any questions yet, and I'm really hoping someone's going to ask a question from the audience because they're very, very quiet. Um, what I would ask is, um, perhaps we can have a short discussion about jobs and wealth. And I'll put this in example. Um, India had a very, very successful wind turbine private investment um, economy for a number of years because people could invest in it and make a return and they could create jobs and they could create, uh, uh, create, uh, create obviously renewable energy, but also create new jobs. I'm just wondering whether or not... Um, the question should not be whether it's the government's problem or whether it's maybe not the government's remit. That's a, I mean, you look at innovation, India is full of innovation. I see it every day, something fantastic coming out of India. I'd be really interested to hear your views about perhaps what was it necessary to do the, to do the carbon tax and do the NCEF if it wasn't going to be done correctly. That That's a question I, I'd, perhaps I'd like to start with you, Professor Sharma, and then let Professor Beharat follow on. Well, I have, I'll be happy to give my comments on it, but I'm not so much familiar with what's happening in India. I've stayed out of India for the last 40 or so years. You sound uh, like me in Australia. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Spent 30 of those years in Australia. Yes, <laughs> we swapped. <laughs> but that's right. Um, yeah, but I think it's uh, that question does come to, uh, it has crossed my mind, although I didn't really have enough detail to comment, uh, to be able to comment on it, that it has had a very successful wind turbine uh, policy. There's a lot of wind there and uh, appreciable, appreciable amount of solar as well. My interest there extend beyond that. These wind and solar turbine, they are, let's say the first generation of turbines, the wind and solar, they are nearing their end of their useful lives because their lives are six to seven years. The so question is, where are we going to dump all these panels and all these wind turbines that are there? So the supply chains are going to extend far beyond India. So you may end up cleaning up the environment to some extent there, but you have ended up creating a lot of mining and mineral related injustice, if I can use that word, uh, to the mines in Congo and so on. Mm -hmm. So I have always had this problem, you know, that these policies are short-sighted. The world that can afford to clean up their place is shifting the problems elsewhere. So it needs a much bigger and much nuanced analysis because all these panels in seven years, they, they are ready for dumping. All the minerals that are um, dug up, they take you to the mines in Congo and elsewhere. So things might be beginning to look okay in terms of meeting your NDCs or whatever you have, but you have moved, shifted the problem. So I think it needs this question of decarbonization is just cannot be answered within just the domain of energy sectors and so on. It has much wider extensions mm. to it. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Professor Bagriath, I'll, I'll recognize you. And then Dr. Dina Azagelaev, I'll get to you after Dr. Bagriath. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Stephen, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, you know, thank uh, uh, Professor Sarma for his uh, detailed comments. And uh, I I'm totally agree with him with all his comments that he made on our paper. Um, I mean, the, the you know, um, it, it's not that we are blaming the government. We what we try to do in this paper is that 
a scheme was launched and it was in a very good intention to create a corpus fund to to be invested in, in invested in r d on solar and and renewable energy technology and picking up from the theories from hartwig rules from you know uh, the dalis uh, harman dalis uh, theory of steady state economy it was uh, quite well intentioned and uh, so what we try to see that try to look at that where exactly you know things went uh, you know gone wrong or uh, in terms of uh, looking at their different projects, they're invested and all. We are not saying that investment in cleaning the environment or cleaning the Ganga is bad. What you are saying is that it, it may not help, you know, so much into the innovations of new technology. And uh, so, so that's you know that's part. I think that I I agree with uh, Professor Sharma's uh, you know uh, uh, comment on and uh, looking at some of the discussions, basically maybe from the looking at from political economy uh, perspective or from the institutional. Uh, you know, uh, dimensions where policy making, how policy are made, and uh, how the governments try to optimize their resources. Maybe that is, maybe it is in their uh, interest to, you know, divert some of the funds for the, you know, the most pressing issues. So, uh, so some of these issues, I think we need to, I mean, we will in incorporate in the paper. I mean, uh, this is fantastic comments, and I really thank you, Professor Sharma, for making yeah, this. Thank uh, you. Comments. And uh, so, yeah, and in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, Stephen's comments about the jo you know the job creations and wealth and and also the wind uh, uh, you know energy issue in India, uh, I think in our paper also we reported that some of this in in terms of literature where we see that state like uh, Tamil Nadu, state like Karnataka, they have put enormous amount of capacity to generate wind, but their realization is very uh, low, and uh, so. It, it has a many other dimension to it. And uh, so probably because of storage problem, because of some other uh, you know, issues that is not being addressed. So it's not that the capacity has not been created. And uh, so, um, so what we see, that is why we see that in the last couple of years that uh, renewable energy has picked up uh, quite significantly because of state interventions and state interests. Uh, a lot of other states like Gujarat and Rajasthan, which has been doing for you know uh, for a long uh, period of time and other states are picking up for example odisha and also west bengal um, has also put up a lot of capacity in recent times and uh, so yes i think there are a lot of issues that i think uh, we need to do research and also find why exactly these capacities are not utilized thank you thank you <laughs> dr dana azagaleb please your floor is yours thank you very much yeah, excellent presentation. I always like to learn from uh, uh, developing countries' experiences. Um, I learned from ADB-led um, Energy Transition Mechanism, ETM. Uh, I heard that um, it's now harder to get funds for fossil fuel uh, power plants or industries, even they used for retiring or repurposing, right? Making them more efficiently. So it's harder to get funds. How about this fund? Uh, was it um, possible to get funds for like power coal-based power plants? This fund, I think this fund has not been allotted towards, you know, coal-based projects. I think I showed you in, in, in one of those tables, where basically uh, some of these funds are actually allocated towards, you know, cleaning environment or some of the very limited amount has gone into the R&D in terms of installing uh, solar voltaic, uh, you know, uh, panels across some of the states. And also, uh, you know, uh, bringing uh, some of these, uh, you know, uh, solar technology to agriculture sector. And uh, so, but this fund has not been, you know, which is rightly said. I mean, the, of course, it has generated through sales, uh, you know, in, in, in coal and uh, lignite and other, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuel, uh, but it has not gone uh, so much into that uh, direction. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Dana, any other questions? Because we've still got another minute and a half left or we can go there into the- There is a question from Dan in chat box. Is there a question from Dan or a comment? Dan, do you wanna, Dan, do you wanna talk? Uh, okay, so Dan's, Dan's talking about the possibility to re, uh, refurbish turbines, which actually is a thing. Um, so I think we're going to find that a lot of these wind turbines uh, actually can be re redeployed or actually re-engineered into other products as well. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Look, I think we're going to have to close this panel up. Uh, Professor Bhagirath Bera and Professor Deepak Sharma, thank you very much for your time. And 
Well, yeah, we made it through this convers we made it through this panel this paper without having any political incidents so congratulations <laughs> well done thank you thank you, thank you. Thank so from the politically sensitive to the circular uh, role of green and circular economy, I'd like to call upon um, Ms. Radia Sadui, who is the Chief of Energy Section in the Climate Change and Natural Resources Sustainability Cluster at the United Nations Economic Social Commission of West Africa, ECOWAS. Um, Ms. Radia is also the President of the Arab Energy Club. Um, so on that note, Ms. Radia, I'll hand over to you to your paper on transforming the extractive industries, the role of green and circular economy, circular carbon economy. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, because I didn't get the time to test my microphone. Very can well. And we, we yeah, hear perfect. you and we see you very well. Welcome. Thank you very much. Let me just try to share my slides. Yeah. Good. Let me put them. Put them on a uh, slideshow yeah. and you're good to yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Up. This one? Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that, yeah. That's not, that, that's, we're seeing that's, the present. Ah, we're seeing, okay. We're seeing the presentation. You had it on full screen before. Ah, okay, let me check. So this uh, one you have duplicated again. So let me check what I have. I like that. That's the one. Well done. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, my time, and um, maybe good afternoon, your time. I believe we are after the 3 p.m. your time, and Japanese time. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dina and the Asian Development Bank Institute for organizing this event, virtual event, and they have the pleasure to present the, uh, the and contribute to, to the session where my focus would be looking to basically how the, uh, the extractive industries uh, would contribute uh, to the energy transition uh, or basically from coal to low carbon future. Uh, the, uh, the, the paper that I suggested basically looking uh, first, given the background of the paper and looking how we can link the extractive industry to sustainability in a way that how they can contribute to the system development goals and the climate agenda. Uh, in addition to uh, basically, uh, I needed uh, after that to look at what are the major challenges in this sector and in order to be to look at to the opportunity that they offer. And since I'm from the Arab region, and more specifically, uh, since the, 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 the GCC region is very much uh, basically uh, um, uh, a major player when it comes to the Asia Pacific and the Asian market. So I needed to look at how their contribution in terms of the extractive industries. But at the same time, what are the major uh, vulnerabilities, uh, as I define the multifaceted energy vulnerability that they have in order to support uh, the sustainability of the extractive sector, be it regional, but also globally. And uh, I come up with with suggestion and the way that we see the circular carbon economy and pathway towards the sustainable energy systems with certain recommendations. Uh, before the basic, before moving forward, I would like just uh, to give a, a definition to the extractive industry since uh, different papers obviously uh, look at different definitions, but let me just focus on the purpose of this paper, what we mean by the extractive industries. The extractive industries can be defined as a process that involves different activities, which include mining and extracting raw materials from the earth, which then undergo processing to be utilized by consumers. So the raw materials materials, maybe hydrocarbons, as we know them, the oil and gas, uh, natural gas, but also minerals. Uh, and uh, most of those I'm um, so focusing here are those that are identified, are those that contribute to the energy transition, mainly the renewable energy technologies and hydrogen and others. Uh, many of these uh, steps in terms of processing, uh, depending on the way that they are undertaken, uh, be it in the, the, those who hold the resources or the countries who have the technologies for processing, but uh, basically what the what's uh, what's well known in the sector is that the circular economy principles of this matter is, is extremely important in order to support the energy transition. 
uh, before starting, uh, let's put uh, in, in this, uh, the outset, uh, the outset what, what would be the contribution of the extractive industries and the global shift that we see it globally. Uh, and dependently of the global scenarios, independently of the which international organization basically that the publish the scenarios, but they all agree that we are moving away from the way that we consume our oil and gas resources and coal as well, the fossil fuels, but we are maybe moving away from that definitively or, or maybe we are transiting to a different way of using these resources. But as a matter of fact, what is important to know that uh, all agree that in order to address the climate action and achieve it within the 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need, we need to invest more in renewable energy, energy efficiency, but also look at alternatives uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the, the technology that we know them, be it hydro, hydro, hydrogen and dependently of its color, but at the same time looking to the carbon management technologies. Uh, and in that sense, since we look at to the contribution of renewable energy and energy efficiency at around 50% of the, 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 the contribution to address the climate action and achieve the system development goals, then Technically speaking, we'll see much more need for the critical raw materials that they contribute to the renewable energy technologies and contribute also to the, the different processes that we have them for the hydrogen as well. Uh, and uh, however, what we need to know uh, that uh, whatever we have as a, as a pathway for energy transition, that we will still have uh, three uh, elements as enablers that we need all to work on them and still, uh, because first the, 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 the market, but also globally, uh, the regions are not balanced and those who hold the resources do not necessarily have the fun and the adequate finance to support the energy transition and to support the investment in the value chain specifically in the extractive sector and at the same time uh, the, they do not have access to the appropriate technologies which still uh, in certain other uh, much more modern uh, societies and uh, uh, countries and at the same time uh, what we see as well that the third element is the capacity building and the need to work on the human capital which should be uh, as, uh, as a pre enabler for the energy transition and energy energy transition. Why focusing also on the extractives? Because uh, if we are looking to the different uh, uh, the sectors where the extractive industries and critical raw materials would support the energy transition, then we need to ensure that whatever we move to another uh, with, uh, on an energy transition should be sustainable, but at the same time, the pathway and to which we would reach uh, to a new energy system, it needs to be much more sustainable in the way we do business today. Because the business, as usual, as so far, is not sustainable, taking it from the economic, the financial, social, but also the environmental risk. And in this respect, if we look at the extractive industries, what we have it and what we try to look at it uh, from the, uh, the, 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 the paper perspective, is that first, from the economic and financial, the, the, the value of some extractive industries, and we see them, if you take the African continent or Latin America, for example, some extractive industries has often resulted in over-dependence in revenues. And revenues from the executive sector uh, to pursue economic diversification. And most of the countries, if I take the region where I operate, uh, the GCC region, where the extractive industries, and specifically the oil and gas sector, uh, is really a, a source of revenue, but also a source of uh, a source of the economic development. And so far, uh, they, they were not able to diversify their economy and leave in them, although they have the resources, be it the GCC or if you take other countries like the, the African uh, countries, leaving the economic uh, vulnerable to economic shocks and price volatilities as we have seen that during COVID. In addition, that uh, active, the, the activities and the extractives are often driven by government and we see less room for the private sector, but at the same time, uh, large companies, sometimes we see uh, the, the, the issues of corruption and uh, poor governance, which lead that, uh, the, the, that uh, these revenues are not helping to address the economic development of these uh, countries and regions. Uh, and this is what I identified as the natural resource management uh, experience in the GCC region, but mostly in the rich, uh, rich, uh, rich countries that they have the wealth of the, the extractive sector. Uh, although it did contribute to uh, the poverty reduction, it did contribute also to have highly educated people, uh, but at the end of the day, we may export most of them to most developed 
developed countries because they do not have the work environment and the enabling environment to, to remain in their countries. And we take from that uh, the, the countries in the, the African continent, for example. But at the same time, in these countries, we still have a little urban divides, which means that the, the executive sector didn't help, obviously, to uh, the to develop both rural and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and urban areas. And we still have in my region, for example, 98% of the uh, the urban uh, in terms of energy access, but at the same time, 82 percent uh, opposed to 80 percent in 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 a rural area. The other aspect is the lack of financial transparency, and this is linked directly to the resource management. Uh, most of the uh, most of the, uh, the, the 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 management since it's dominated by national oil and companies, but at the same time, government institutions hold the resources. It made that there is also a lack of financial transparency, given that the data reporting system also is not adequate. But at the same time, the illicit financial flows within the executive sector doesn't help, uh, obviously, to uh, identify what's where where the, the revenues are and how the executive sector contribute to the the economic development in addition to that that the the, the that uh, due, due to that that the, the executive sector is is very harmful and it's not just looking to the fossil fuels but also the critical material and mining sector the environmental climate uh, if we take it from the environmental climate we still see that these industries have a significant environmental impact on both the local communities the indigenous peoples but at the same time it has also an impact on the water and water contamination, salt contamination, but at the same time, the, if you take it from the whole value chain, we'll see also impact on the water use and, and at the same time, it's also competing for the water use for other purposes uh, as we know them. Uh, and this is due to the, the limited uh, limited legislation and weak law enforcement uh, uh, in the, in, that lead to the, that, the, the ecosystem uh, degradation, but also the biodiversity city loss. And if we take, for example, the, the, the GCC region that uh, where I operate mostly, that we have a high level of air pollution, but at the same time, in terms of percentage, although they contribute to the lowest uh, globally, but they have the highest rate of increase of air pollution, but at the same time, uh, CO2 emission. And this obviously make it that the executive sector would not uh, and is not yet ready to support the, the, the economic diversification, but at the same time, the energy transition and to how to transition to low carbon. Uh, in most of the, the places that we know them also when it comes from the social impact, the executive sector is really uh, not uh, appropriate in terms of social contract. And we see that very difficult, uh, difficult I would say, condition for the workers uh, when it comes to the uh, work in the mining sector. And you see it in different uh, uh, regions uh, globally as well. But we see also the gender dimension where we see that women involved in the sector still uh, minimal. But at the same time, it's they are not having the right enabling environment to work in this sector. In in uh, to to the, so summarize that, that when we see the sustainability of the extractive sector, it's need to be really look at from uh, how we can make the extractive sector that can support the energy transition, and how to ensure that we change the business model in a way that we have it as a pillar for development and changing obviously uh, the landscape globally for those who hold the resources and those who have the technologies to. Uh, for processing. And this is in this slide, I try to look at the sustainability with the executive sector from different pillars. If we take the, the if we take it from the possible spillover, so certainly the modern mining and oil companies, they try to do a lot of work in terms of integrating the sustainable development goals uh, and the, the corporate social responsibility as well in a way that they, wherever they operate, they try to adjust the social context, the environmental context, and obviously uh, the, the, the involvement of the the local communities and the indigenous people, but they still have far away to, to, uh, uh, to, to be much more sustainable in the way they, they work on that. Uh, in addition to that, that the, the, the opportunity, employment opportunities, if we take it from the uh, employment opportunities, I see that they have time uh, running and the infrastructure linkages, because when we speak about the extractive sector, so we are not just addressing one value chain, it's really an, an integrated approach that we, we need to look at it. The other 
aspect is the, the, the natural resources as an engine for economic and social development. Yes, the executive industries can really help to create value of the long term, if we take it from the long value chain. It has the potential also to create a competitive local supply industry if we, we use the circular economy. And also if we have the technology and knowledge as well, then we are able to create a very uh, a strong econo economy. The stakeholder engagement also is extremely important because it's a sector that help to really uh, give opportunities to much more private public partnerships to also to engage with the social society and give the opportunities to develop the local content. Uh, the, uh, as we know it's that uh, globally the reproduction of many energy transition millions today is more geographically concentrated. So as is said in this slide, for example, all those who hold the fossil fuels and specifically the oil and gas sector are mostly in the GCC countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, for example, and Qatar and others. But we see also that those who hold the resources in terms of the extractors and critical raw materials, and in the, 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 the African continent, Latin America, like we take the cobalt, mostly more than 90% in the DRC, which shows that globally, we need to work together in order to have much more balanced system, and in order to ensure that we have a smooth, but also sustainable transition. And that's why I wanted to focus on the region where I operate in a way that how we can support the energy transition globally and the Asia and the Asian markets. We need for that, we need to address our vulnerabilities. Most of them are related to the, uh, the demand for energy, which is extremely increasing due to the system of economic de the development and the lack of energy efficiency. Also, the subsidized prices, be it for energy, but also for water, and the high dependence of this, uh, this uh, region from the oil and gas revenues Mr. as Radia, a source of revenue. Time. Yes. Yes, and then and then basically that's why I'm recommending to to have to look at to the circular carbon economy framework in terms of looking how we can use the reduce, the reuse, the recycle, and remove as a pathway to support the extractive sector. And in this uh, and this economy in this uh, framework, I'm putting the, the the some of the technology that can under which. Ma'am, I'm going to have work. to shut you down. I'm sorry, we run out of time. Ms. Radia. I can hear you. I want to finish with a recommendation, if I may. Uh, I'm sorry, you've run out of time. I'm sorry, we can't do it. My apologies, but we had 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm sorry. Um, so to uh, to provide... I, I, I... Okay. Um, uh, to provide uh, a discussion of uh, this paper, I invite Dr. Zaresh Atakanova who is the Associate Professor of the Schools in Mining and Geoscience at the Narabayev University in Kazakhstan. Dr. Zarash, the floor is yours. Okay, so hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, thank you, uh, ADB colleagues, uh, for uh, the opportunity to participate in this um, uh, workshop. Uh, so um, uh, I would like to provide some feedback on uh, the draft paper, uh, which uh, Ms. Radia Sidawi has just presented. So um, uh, first, um, I would like to summarize uh, the content of the draft paper and then provide some uh, suggest uh, suggestions that uh, the authors um, might consider. So uh, first of all, um, the paper starts uh, with the discussion of how extractive industries have fueled economic growth in a number of low and middle income countries. But as it is a well known fact that this uh, type of economic growth uh, uh, based on natural resource extraction uh, can hardly be considered um, as um, uh, compatible with sustainable development goal unless uh, extractive industries uh, 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 undergo some deep transformation. So um, uh, the, um, some of the initiatives that uh, major companies in extractive industries have uh, recently put forward, uh, such as the ones that are based on um, greater integration of uh, um, green energies and circular carbon uh, economies, uh, may uh, help uh, such transformation as, as well as help uh, the relevant countries uh, meet uh, their climate uh, change, um, climate policy goals. Uh, in addition, uh, these practices uh, may help um, local communities 
uh, and, um, by creating jobs and create uh, uh, opportunities for local businesses. Uh, one such um, uh, uh, promising uh, technology is a low carbon hydrogen technology uh, that provides um, opportunities for uh, meeting climate policy goals uh, in countries uh, from Gulf Corporation Council, GCC, that m m many of them are major fossil fuel exporters. So that's um, the summary. Uh, and uh, I think the paper in general raises a very, very important issue. Um, as uh, Ms. Radia Sidao has just uh, presented to us uh, the issue of uh, diver economic diversification, uh, economic, uh, environmental degradation and climate impact it represents a multifaceted uh, challenge in many developing countries. So this issue uh, ha has, um, you know, is of uh, very significant interest in many countries. So uh, the author has um, uh, presented a balanced discussion of uh, challenges faced by um, uh, specifically GCC countries with respect to very rapid population growth, uh, energy price distortions, underdeveloped energy efficiency standards, uh, limited economic diversification and climate impact. Uh, also, the author has provided with a detailed discussion of the Circular Carbon Economy uh, Initiative um, of uh, uh, extractive uh, industry uh, companies that um, rely on the four R's principles, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. And the paper has uh, initiated an important discussion of the role of um, hydrogen um, uh, production of hydrogen as uh, a, a vehicle for diversifying the energy mix in GCC countries. So um, um, I would like to make some suggestions on how um, the paper uh, can be maybe further developed if um, uh, the authors are, are interested in um, uh, such, you know, um, um, opinion, then I would like to uh, propose that the paper mostly focuses on how the CCE and development of hydrogen cluster may address specific challenges in, uh, Gulf, in the Gulf countries. Um, a lot of the discussion that um, uh, focuses on current challenges may be very effectively presented by various uh, data visualization uh, tools. So GDP growth, youth unemployment, uh, environmental, various environmental indicators may be actively incorporated in, into the paper to uh, make the discussion uh, more uh, substantial. Um, also, I strongly recommend that the author uh, provides more specific uh, technical background on the proposed uh, technologies, uh, specifically on the types of hydrogen and the kinds of CCE uh, technologies uh, that uh, have been proposed uh, in these countries. Uh, and especially in this case, I really suggest to uh, rely on text boxes as a way of presenting this technical information. So um, I also suggest that uh, uh, more analysis is uh, done on um, um, CCE and hydrogen initiatives, uh, not only in the Gulf countries, but also in other jurisdictions such, such as in the EU. And in fact, had some research has been done by the EU colleagues on hydrogen uh, sector, hydrogen cluster development specifically in the Gulf countries. So, uh, this uh, research may be useful in updating some, updating some valuable data for this paper in question. So um, uh, with respect to methodology, I propose to maybe consider the forward-backward linkages approach. So in general, this approach could be both quantitative and qualitative. For quali quantitative approach, uh, you need some data from input-output uh, tables uh, at a very disaggregated uh, level. However, since information on uh, uh, these uh, new technologies that extractive industries are uh, in the process of developing is not likely 
to be available um, uh, in, at a detailed level. Uh, still, forward and backward linkages and methodology may be used at, in a qualitative manner. So basically, the idea is uh, to try to demonstrate that developing, for, for example, a hydrogen cluster in the Gulf countries may provide some very important impetus uh, to uh, those industries that um, uh, supply uh, important resources or services to the hydrogen production. We call them backward links. Uh, as well as uh, stimulate uh, activity in industries that require resources from the hydrogen cluster. So for example, um, uh, green hydrogen uh, technology uh, requires uh, significant amounts of renewable energy sources. Uh, and the Gulf, um, uh, uh, go, uh, go, the, um, uh, the countries uh, that we discussed in this paper, they do have very significant renewable energy potential that uh, to a large degree remains underutilized. So how does the hydrogen um, cluster development help? Uh, will provide an impetus for uh, developing RESs. What are some of the uh, challenges that I've experienced that are there? What are the following policy implications? Some other important considerations that need to be uh, taken is uh, hydrogen production requires very significant quantities of water. How does this, uh, uh, how is this going to be handled in a, in a region where water is in shortage and uh, this uh, problem is expected to further exacerbate in the future? So as a result, this type of approach, I think, will um, uh, uh, provide you with some very important policy implications. One potential policy implication is uh, further reform of fossil fuel subsidies in order to deal with the uh, RES uptake. Uh, and um, I think that in terms of the uh, value of this paper uh, will be uh, very significant if the focus is on, trans on the potential of hydrogen cluster and the CCE approach uh, for transforming the broader economy and dealing with a diversified energy mix, undiversified economic base, um, uh, low, um, uh, um, so, uh, low unemployment, uh, et cetera. Uh, and um, I think this type of focus will um, be um, quite interesting. Uh, so basically, uh, many more things could be done, such as um, discussing the strategies. Are there strategies for developing hydrogen clusters? Are they harmonized with other jurisdictions, such as the EU? And whether the CCE and hydrogen technology cluster uh, are likely to uh, um, you know, increase cooperation between the countries in this region and beyond? So basically, I, I suggest to the author to maybe slightly adjust the focus of the paper and rather than considering transformation of extractive industries, maybe consider how extractive industries can contribute to transforming economies in the region Zarish, by supporting new technologies. Thank you, Dr. Zarish. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Thank you. I'm finished. Okay, super. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any questions from the floor, but I'm expecting we will. What I wanted to ask is, um, there are a number of recommendations, um, some of which I'm not familiar with. Uh, the hydrogen stuff I am, but there are some specific technologies. Dr. Ruddy, would you, uh, Ms. Ruddy, would you be able to show your slide on the detailed uh, things again, if you could, please, just so we can talk about that a bit more? Yes, but uh, my understanding, my paper is not a hydrogen paper, with due respect. I have a, a book on hydrogen. The purpose of this exercise in 8,000 words is just to highlight on how we transform the extractive industries following the circular carbon economy framework. Anything under the, under the myth of that, it's a, it's a paper on itself. And it's not the purpose of going through all these details in a just simple presentation, which I can share my other books on the topic. In terms of the recommendation, thank you very much. But just uh, to want to highlight uh, the purpose is not the hydrogen. The hydrogen is just part of the story. Uh, and it's not the whole story. Uh, and uh, I personally, uh, I'm not a fan of uh, focusing the transformation 
integration of the energy system, speaking hydrogen, from our perspective in the region. And globally, uh, uh, we already had papers on the hydrogen. We know perfectly the challenges what are in the region, including the desalination of the water, including the issues of the electricity prices and the reforms. But the, uh, again, the circular carbon economy, I just want to focus on this. This is important. If we don't move from a, a system which is not sustainable and it's not uh, the circular carbon economy framework is not adapted, then not only the region, but globally, we will not be able to achieve the stream development goals and we will not be able to achieve the net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, and uh, the, the example that uh, uh, someone who speak about the hydrogen, hydrogen for us is just under the deuce. It's part of the solutions. It's not the only solution mm. because for, uh, and it's uh, the renewable energy, energy efficiency, hydrogen, nuclear power, uh, ammonia, uh, uh, all of that. But what, more importantly, in the executive sector, and how to the best use of carbon in the value chain of the extractives through the use and the cycle. And obviously we believe that if you want to achieve the net zero, you need to invest in carbon management technologies. So the recommendations is really to invest more and upgrade the target for renewable energy. It's to accelerate the, the hard, low carbon hydrogen strategy and promote the region electricity markets. So how the region can support globally. As a matter of fact that also as a discussion well highlighted in our sector if we don't reform properly the energy our water sectors from pricing from the market structure of the dominance of the national oil companies but also the national electricity companies we have done nothing because we need to give room to the, the uh, to the private sector and public mm -hmm. partnerships and uh, to finish also that uh, we speak about the economic diversification creating jobs specifically from a gender perspective because uh, the, the, the paper intended in 8,000 words is to highlight the changes and the opportunities. De diving inside on that, you need to have much more the room to, 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 to develop the paper in a way to see specifically through the circular carbon economy, reuse and recycle, we create SMEs, we can uh, we are able to use this sector in much more the in much more sustainable way in our uh, economies. And obviously that's why the carbon management technologies are extremely important because number one they they remove the carbon from the atmosphere they give a reason for the circular carbon economy framework to be used and more importantly they are the one who can help also to achieve the net zero by the 2050 or 2060 so this is what's the purpose of the exercise uh, to that's why i wanted to focus on it thank you thank thank you for doing that and i note on your slide you have a recommendation for monetizing gas flaring and there's a question from yep. the floor and i'll read it What's the state with respect to gas flaring reduction in the petroleum industry in Western Asia? What is the prospects for using carbon markets or the energy transition mechanism, which is buying out carbon, to monetize the reduction in gas flaring? I think it's uh, because one of the challenges ADB has is our energy policy stops us doing anything upstream and gas flaring could be considered upstream. I really appreciate your thoughts on this because it's a topic that's important to us right now in our operations. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Actually, the gas flaring uh, from, uh, from, uh, as I'm from the gas sector I uh, used to be, uh, we can take it from the upstream and then down, midstream and downstream actually. And the, you have the possibilities to uh, monitor this gas flaring across the value chain, even at the LNG uh, plants and the gasification. And the, uh, we've done a paper on the uh, different uh, possibilities how to monetize that specifically from our region, we do have countries who have a problem of electricity access when they flare uh, above the global average in terms of gas, and uh, like Iraq, for example. And uh, the possibilities you have them be it for the whether at the upstream side using them for electricity generation or byproducts as we know them for the gas industry. But all of that it depends on the volumes and it depends on the infrastructure available. However, from the carbon market, and this is where we link the circular carbon economy framework. We Within the region, we already have seen the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, who already announced uh, the, the way that they are the, uh, keen to develop national, but also involuntary carbon markets. So this is part of the, the, the framework that we are speaking of. And uh, basically, this will add to the upstream value of the, the, the gas, but also oil. But at the end of the day, it cannot be in the way that we see it in European markets, because uh, in order to make it sustainable, we need first to work on the reforms of the activity city and the petroleum product market mm. and you need as well to not only which we are far away to to achieve this target uh, and in addition to that 
we need to have a real uh, a trading system uh, that we the, the oil and gas companies can lead on that, obviously, because we still far away in terms of uh, decentralizing system and having much more the private sector and SMEs involved. And that's why the 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 the, the Aramco, for example, is trying to, to 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 work on that. But at the same time, uh, Adnok as well in United Arab Emirates are trying to work on that. Uh, but uh, so far, we are trying to now launch uh, something we call it the Circular Carbon Economy Knowledge Hub and Center. And our work will be how to create regional markets uh, by using the Circular Carbon Economy Framework why we we will try to see what the carbon market regionally works uh, globally and to try to learn from that in order to create it uh, uh, regionally then we can basically uh, uh, think about uh, that it could be a trading uh, system but it's still it's something that we cannot see it after let's say five years from now okay that's a really interesting answer because um one of the things for us is that we see these projects in in, in isolation and when you talk about gas flaring, people say, oh, no, it's not right. But when you team it up with uh, sector reform and capability development and actually refocusing people towards the better use of carbon and the better use of resources with a limited pool of, uh, I mean, countries like India, which have massive problems with energy full stop because they've got so much demand. That's interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting outcome. Dan, I would be suggesting that you might want to reach out to Ms. Radia and uh, possibly talk a bit more because there could be a lot of information you could gather. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, I've got one question for you. Um, the use of ex extended producer responsibility schemes is talked a lot about in consumer products. Do you think that there's space for that in the oil and gas industry? Because obviously that leads into the concept of a carbon price and a carbon price may allow for more efficient production. Do you think it might work or I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that? Yes, actually, now we, we move to a political uh, political dimension of the circular carbon economy, and that's why we have it under T20, and we have in a paper under this T20 in India this year. Uh, when we say circular carbon economy, we already, uh, specifically the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, already assumed the responsibility as an oil and gas producer toward the decarbonization. However, the pathways are different. So the responsibility, it's like you, you've taken, so the, the carbon market, the carbon price, it's already part of that. So if I'm speaking about taking the whole value chain from the upstream till the, 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 the final product, I'm not just speaking about the final product or mm. the producer, I'm taking the full value chain. So the carbon footprints would be identified and each take responsibility of how much carbon emitted and pay for it. So this is the principle. And we, we if we apply this, then we will be, if I take a mobile, all of us will be responsible. The one who produces the, 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 the metals and the, the minerals and the oil and gas resources that led to have the, the, the mobile. And and the one who have it till the, the, the last uh, who, who sold it. So all of us from following the circular carbon economy framework, we already define the carbon price in the whole value chain, and we already uh, uh, take the responsibility of decarbonization of the value chain, provided provided we all of us contribute to that, and not individually, and it's not just the upstream, it's all of us through the value chain. And that's why the extractive sector, if we want to have a sustainable energy transition, then for the electric vehicle as a just a simple example for so we go back to the drc and those who have the cobalt the resources and we try to help them in order to unlock these resources have a sustainable value chain and have an, an economy and peace and stability and then so that that we can have a complete value chain that all of us can achieve the net zero by the horizon that are different from a country to another one well, you finished spot on the money. And I've got to tell you, for the last two minutes, I would have paid money to listen to that. Um, that was <laughs> excellent. Uh, we wish you really well with your Circular Carbon Economy Centre and initiatives. Um, I didn't quite understand what your paper was about until the last two minutes, and now I get it. So um, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Zarev, for your commentary on the paper. Um, so ladies, thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to the final paper. And the final paper is by Dr. Andrea Gatto, who is the Senior Assistant Professor at Wengzhou Keen University. Um, he's a research fellow at, and lecturer at NRI in the University of Greenwich. 
Um, he's eminently qualified and he's going to talk to us about energy transition in the People's Republic of China, assessing progress in sustainable development and resilient, resilience directions. Uh, uh, Dr. Gatto, the floor is yours, sir. Yes, uh, can you see me because my screen is not really good. Yeah, it, it's a bit like something out of a sci-fi movie at the moment. Yes. It's a bit green and um, uh, yeah. perhaps do you, can you put your presentation on and can we see that or do we need to get someone uh, to do I your presentation? I send my presentation, should I put it or? Just try and put it up and if you can't do it, then we'll have to get okay. the host to run it. So I'm gonna can, share in we, the screen, right? Yeah, I'm not getting your share screen. Sorry for um, interviewing. Andrea, I think you're using yeah. weak internet connection. Uh, could you please uh, turn camera off? Uh, My camera off. Okay. Yeah. Dana, can we? Do we have a copy of? Uh, yes, uh, and um, uh, our team uh, will share uh, your screen. Hmm. Uh, okay, you. so I I should but, stop my sharing, right? Yes, please. Yeah, I think you have internet issue. That's fine now. Yes, please. Okay. All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. It's indeed very, uh, I'm indeed very pleased. All the time zone doesn't help at all. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, I'm quite sick, so um, I couldn't join before. Uh, I'll do my best. Andrea, I'm I think gonna you, present might, think, you might want yes. to turn your camera off and just let the presentation my go. Camera it's, off. It's, a, okay, it's a bit of a distraction, that's all. Yes, I cannot see this. So, all right. Is that okay now? Yeah, it's great. Thank you. So I'm going to be presenting um, this paper I co-authored on energy transition in China um, that is based on a composite indicator. Uh, should you should I tell you when I need a new slide? Yes, please. Okay, you want to? So I call for this paper um, uh, with Professor uh, Drago Alberi and Panarello. Uh, yeah, second one. Okay, yeah, this is the outline of the paper of the presentation. Um, we're going to diving into the research questions of this. Uh, draft and then defining energy resilience because the paper is mostly about energy resilience and sustainable development progress in China. Uh, of course, we will mention development agenda, sustainable development, development goals, policy and regulation on energy resilience, and then analyzing quickly the data based on the World Bank's uh, rise and mentioning the methodology used for reaching this interval-based compute indicator. And finally, we're gonna <coughs> launching uh, the key results, conclusions, and policy indications. Okay, one, two. Okay, so basically, uh, we are going to quickly uh, define what energy resilience is, uh, and then we, we're gonna put a focus on the regulatory framework, basically, and on the sustainable development goals. As you know, there is a whole goal for energy and resilience term to vote also for this uh, proposal. Um, and when it comes to computing a, a global composite indicator, so we're gonna compare in first China with other countries, uh, because this exercise is based on another exercise that was uh, basically aiming at uh, presenting an, a, a worldwide comparison. And we will uh, focus on the fact that robustness, ranking, and results are important. And this exercise was done for 111 OECD and non-OECD countries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so um, we define energy resilience as the ability of an energy system to retain, react, overcome, and overpass the phase of perturbation caused by a major shock. And we use sustainability as a focus. So we focus on uh, the enlarged dimensions of um, sustainability, taking into account the size, the economic, social, environmental component, also the institutional governance one. Uh, that is based again on this other exercise. 
exercise uh, published in 2020. Uh, basically, we want to improve the quality of life of vulnerable categories, and we are interested in strategies to face the dimensions of vulnerability. So the vulnerable, but also vulnerability. Uh, so we want to analyze these four dimensions of sustainability, so called here, uh, by making use of complex indicators. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, um, SDG number seven aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern, modern energy for all. There are four, five targets and six indicators based on access to energy, uh, renewable energy, energy security, efficiency, uh, clean energy, and technology and infrastructure are uh, the focus of uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals drafted in 2015. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of data, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to, uh, we, we have used this the RISE, the regulatory indicators for sustainable energy. That's why there's fundamental regulation and national policies. So it's uh, the original exercise is a cross section uh, based on 27 indicators that are then uh, merged. Um, indicators, therefore, in a unique composite indicator. Uh, with 111 countries, we have 96% of our population. Uh, the year of interest is 2016. Why? Because at the moment of the exercises, this was the last issued uh, version of the RISE and the most complete as well. Um, so these are, okay, it's issued by the World Bank, but there are other partners as well. And the three main pillars are energy access, efficiency, and renewable energy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as you can see, uh, there is a plethora of um, variables uh, from energy access, efficiency, and renewable energy, um, including utility ready workness, incentives uh, from electricity, Structures, carbon pricing, and monitoring, and so on. Next slide, please. So basically, we look at the polarity, yeah, to determine energy resilience. So uh, obviously, the more um, countries are uh, following these three variables, these, these three main variables, these three dimensions, the more they are resilient. There is a normalization, therefore a weighting and an aggregation from 27 to 3 to 1 variable. Um, and we made use of equal weighting, a linear aggregation with respect to uh, World Bank's rise. Uh, the value added is the interval data that is per se, per definition, by definition is robust. So we have done as a Quite a substantial methodological improvement with the original index from the rise from the other. And uh, this serves also as a robustness analysis. Our exercise. Can, uh, can we move on, please? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we want to we build the composite indicator. Uh, by definition, this is more robust, more resilient, and delivers better outputs also for communication and policy making. Uh, so we examine an interval. Okay, of values instead of a single uh, value. So, of, of course, data is more reliable. Uh, and we make use of symbolic data, and this way uh, we have better results. And the variation in complex indicators is also the measure of the indicators itself. Uh, and we make use of uncertainty analysis as a sensitivity analysis. Next one, please. Okay, so uh, here we dive into results. As you can see, uh, this is the series. So when you see white countries, these are not covered um, by this analysis uh, because of lack of data <coughs> from the World Bank and partners. Uh, the pale ones are less resilient, the dark ones are resilient. So as we can see, China is quite resilient with respect to the vast majority of countries. But when it comes to the West, the so Europe, US, Australia, and so on, and 
there are some differences. So let's uh, see which differences we can notice in the next slide. Okay, so when it comes to the first pillar, the first dimension, energy access, China behaves very well. Uh, this is, however, uh, many countries are at the first uh, place. Why? Because it's simply either you have the, this variable or you don't have. So this is quite easy to reach. This result. So, for instance, existence and monitoring of, of officially approved electric pilot education plan. Do you have it? Yes. Okay. First rank. Um, of course, this is also uh, uh, measured by means of the interval based compass indicate, indicator, the distance from the band. Okay. So we have zero because it's the first. Okay. So in all these variables, uh, China is performing. Uh, very well, it's even outstanding globally. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next, yeah, thank you. Um, when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, we start noticing some issues, okay? So with respect to uh, other countries, in some variables, China performs very well, even globally. This is the case of financing mechanism for energy efficiency, where it ranks first or uh, energy labeling systems that, where it ranks uh, six and so and so on but then for other variables like information provided to consumers about electricity usage uh, or other variables like building energy codes uh, china does not perform well next slide please this is reflected in the last pillar the renewable energy where for some variable China outstands like legal framework for renewable energy and counterparty risk that it does not even regionally. I mean, regionally it performs still uh, decently or even well, but does not outstand when it comes to planning for renewable energy expansion uh, or incentives and regulatory support for renewable energy and so on. Next slide, please. So let's drop some key conclusions. Uh, basically, what we notice after our exercise is that uh, in energy resilience and sustainable development, China performs way better than uh, basically all African countries, and in many cases, also South America and its regional neighbors. Not always, and it depends on the country. Of course, there are countries performing uh, better in some variables like Japan, uh, but for for instance, when compared to Mongolia or other neighbors, uh, usually or or even always China performs better as expected. Uh, however, uh, China below uh, performs below Europe, where top thirty five, northern even South America in some cases and Oceania. Um, there is significant progress in a better energy transition and resilience and need to improve energy vulnerability figures. Uh, as I said, energy access is uh, excellent in terms of results, uh, but energy efficiency and, and ren uh, renewable energy results are good all, only at the region level. Uh, and we know that coal is still China's primary energy source, but it's decreasing notably in the last 15 years, especially with the power infrastructure modernization. Next slide, please. Okay, so this turned into an evolution of energy policy and energy transition from China. Uh, and many policies and tools were used uh, when it comes to especially environmental and economic development. Uh, energy security increased, uh, figures related to promotion of renewables increased, and also energy efficiency. So there is the need to invest more in energy as logical uh, and in policies uh, where it comes to zero energy building targets because China uh, is still falling behind in this regard, but this policy is interesting and financing. Next slide, please. Okay, next steps for this or other exercises, other domestic or regional analysis, studies of Chinese provinces, other variables, aspects of energy transition for China. 
Uh, I leave you with some references in the next three slides that you may want to check. Next slide, please. So you can swiftly pass it. These are three slides. You can move on, move on, move on. Yes, more, more, more. No, no, go ahead and done. Yeah, I just okay. want to leave my contacts. Thank you. Dr. Gatto, thank you very much. Finished exactly on time. Well done. <laughs> um, so, uh, shall I try you... to turn my video on? Can yes, if you want to, it's, it's yeah. going to probably be a little bit, a bit green. We'll see how you go. Mm -hmm. um, to, oh, now it's perfect. Fantastic. Um, now to discuss your paper, I call upon Dr. Zhao Zhijin, uh, who's a senior research fellow at the ADBI. Uh, previous to that, she was with the Ministry of Finance uh, Director responsible for bilateral and multilateral financial uh, cooperation. And most of all, she's an ex-ADB staffer who has been here in HQ, where I'm calling you from. So, uh, Dr. Yao, your, the floor is yours, ma'am. Yeah, I already share my screen. Thank you, Stephen. Can you see my screen sharing? K, K, K. Okay. Oh, nice to meet you. I used to work for ADB headquarters for three years, manager the PRC fund. Right now it merged in SBCC, you are working. Yes, I know your fund very well. Yeah, can you see me? Uh, I yep. just see my screen. Okay. Yeah, can and see both. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you uh, give this opportunity for me to be discussed here. And I would like to thank, thank you, uh, Professor Gato, for your excellent presentation. I really enjoy reading your paper and listen to your presentation. And I found uh, in your presentation, even your the original paper sent to me, you already improved a lot, maybe. So if I have some comments here, you already improved your paper, just like now it. Then my discussion, including four parts. First, uh, I really would like to share some background. Uh, I found that uh, the background already elaborated in your paper, Professor Gato. I, I would like to provide some supplementary <laughs> background, maybe it's helpful. And then I will have a very quick summary of your paper. And then I have some questions, comments, and uh, some suggestions. So regarding the background, as we know, uh, the distribution of China energy uh, sector in China, including coal, natural gas, yeah, hydro power, and wind energy, and the solar energy. And now the thermal power was, and still remains the primary source of power generation in China and the renewable energy you mentioned, actually the source uh, making up more and more of China total power generation. And then uh, we, I have read some also paper and also the some website of central government of China, the website, they have some, a lot of database and uh, papers there. So I list some of them. Uh, the domestic view, for example, China has been investing uh, heavily in renewable energy with the total installed energy capacity of re, uh, renewable energy increasing uh, uh, rapidly. And then some global view share with you. In 2022, China expansion in solar and wind power far more than any other country. And China climbs to top among global leaders in ter terms of large scale clean energy deployment. I would like to have a very quick summary of your paper, Professor Gatu. So the objective of your paper compared China's energy profile with the regional and global levels. And uh, the data you mentioned, the uh, regulatory indicators for sustainable energy. And the methodology also you already elaborated that uh, sing single interval based composite indicators was constructed and multi times uh, simulations obtained an uh, interval and then compared each other. The result uh, is China is on the international based practice for energy access, but not for energy efficient and renewable energy. Then I have some uh, general comments. Um, I have these questions. Maybe you're already answering your presentation, please. Just, uh, I hope it's uh, helpful for you to think about. Well, why did you construct a new indicators? As we know, there are already some kind of indicators there and are the other lacking or does not measure what this paper wants to measure? And then another question is, how is this paper filling up the uh, gap in the literature? 
The paper uh, does not highlight too much the literature gap, uh, the needs of this paper and uh, this analyze, uh, if you agree. So, and then third is we have done some research in this field. How is this paper different from others? Uh, this question is similar to the second one, just for your um, reference. And then I have another question. What is the control group? Why compare China to this particular region or group of countries? Uh, perhaps it's better for you to elaborate it, uh, the reason may be better. Then uh, you already have some uh, definition on terms like uh, energy resilient. I also find that there are some terms here, uh, energy access, energy efficiency, renewable energy. So could you please define some um, terms used in the paper before making an argument and uh, discuss the contest in China by structuring it using the defined concepts. Then uh, some comments on the introduction and the methodology. Uh, the introduction, uh, from my point of view, okay, it should be written more uh, succinctly and it jumps to some uh, different arguments. And then it is not clear what is the main point is. So um, then also I mentioned that you, there are some uh, paper already there. And also even you list in your reference list, some paper already done by you and your colleagues. And uh, would you like to highlight some of the uh, shining point of this paper, maybe better. And then the literature review also like that. You did uh, some literature review there and uh, perhaps uh, they should be uh, structured in a way that brings the literature gap and uh, some arguments. Okay, and then regarding the methodology, the data is from uh, Gato and Jago, your uh, yeah, 2020, but uh, which paper is it from? Maybe you already improved it in your final paper. When I saw it is your original paper sent by my ADBI colleagues. So if you name this kind of data, like uh, 2028 20, and in the reference, then uh, the equations uh, explain the equations one and two. What is the x under bar and the xi yeah, over bar yeah, in, in your paper? I find that. So I list this question here and also argument. Um, could you please write out how the methodology is relevant and very innovative uh, as claimed in your paper? I'm not sure if my comments, <laughs> yeah. I hope it can help. And uh, based on my uh, background, I would like to share with you some uh, a link, maybe it's useful. I found you are from uh, Wenzhou Ken University, which is already located in China. So uh, even though this kind of uh, link of the um, database and some government uh, website are in Chinese, but uh, I hope it's easy for you to find someone to help you to read it. They actually, they are very useful database. For example, I just give you some example. Uh, the 2022 year book about China, uh, Chinese statistical data of energy. So there is a yearly book every year, and then you can find uh, some useful data compared with them. Maybe it's helpful. And for example, another example, uh, the 2021 annual report of China, Chinese ecological uh, environment. They, this, pay, this book also, I, I just read it. I found they are very useful data and uh, analysis there. And the third example for uh, China, uh, Marble Source Environmental Management Annual Report. So this kind of a report, actually, you may also notice that they have uh, rich data and some analysis maybe is helpful for you uh, to improve your paper. And also I would like to provide some uh, reference link in English. Uh, I have been working for PRC government, Minister of Finance for more than 20 years, and I in charge of the PRC ADB projects. Most of the projects actually focus on energy transition nowadays. And then we already have some very good projects, just like uh, maybe Stephen understand that every investment, every investment project we have, uh, before we have the investment project, we have some ADB technical assistant projects there. From this assistant to uh, technical assistant uh, projects, they are very good uh, analyzed report. So from, for example, this PRC developing cost effective policy investment to achieve climate and uh, air quality goal in Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region. 
they have TA. So if you read this, may be helpful. Another project, Heilongjiang, modernizing of heat resource, spread walls and car pollution, another project. And then Shanxi energy uh, efficiency and the environment improvement project. Maybe this is helpful. You just search it on the website of EDVI, ADB. Okay, thank you. That's all for my comments. Actually, it's a good project. I really enjoy to read it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Dr. Zhao. Uh, Dr. Gatti, would you like to, Professor Gatti, should you like to respond? There's a few things to unpack there. Yes, 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 surely. Can you see me? I yeah, we can. Sure. You're flickering mm. around a bit, but we can see you. Oh, I only have 50 seconds. Okay, wow. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, we're, no. we're now on Q&A. We've got another 10 minutes. Ah, okay. okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, good. Say 10 minutes, well, all good. Uh, mm -mm. Okay, well, so many insights. Thank you very much, uh, Professor or Dr. Yao. I don't, I don't remember. Okay, whatever. Um, Senior so, research mm, fellow. Research fellow. Um, okay, well, first question was related. Can you see me or because I see myself dancing in green? I don't know. It's okay. It's very exotic. Just it's, keep going. It's exotic. Okay. okay. Good. Uh, so first question was related to coal and thermal energy. Okay. Uh, I think, and all the other questions related to this. So maybe uh, we are analyzing different data and for different years. So this was the 2016 report, from, right, as I mentioned during my presentation, that when we started this work a couple of years ago was the last available issue and also the most complete because a new issue was about to come but didn't have a lot of data. So we decided to use this version of the RISE, okay? Um, so the RISE is based, I can pick my slides. Um, See my slides? No? Uh, not yet. Not Got yet. them. Yeah? Oh. It's a bit confusing. All right. So, um, this data are based on, okay, uh, sustainable energy for all, SE for all initiative. So, World Bank Group, ESMAP, Energy Center Management System Program. And CIF, Climate Investment Funds. These are the three main sources. Uh, they may be mm, criticized. Actually, that's why we run the, the indicator, and that's the reply to another question of yours. So basically, we want to make it more robust with respect to the original one, because the original one is not really robust as indicator and more coherent. Also with literature, and also with definitions of energy resilience and sustainable development. Um, so we wanted to focus more on this angle. Uh, here comes also the novelty hmm, of the research, in our opinion. Uh, so extant literature didn't focus really on this triangulation. The more robust indicators for energy resilience and sustainable development. So as you mentioned, this is part of a broader project where we published a few papers with some of my colleagues. And the one that you mentioned uh, extensively, that is, well, actually the one that is more related to this work is, uh, yeah, Gato and Drago 2020 that was published in Ecological Economics. And this is Gato and Drago. And I should have put in the reference list as well. Yeah, this one. Can you see it? Bullet point number four. Uh, then there are other works. Uh, I don't remember exactly because there were many slides. Uh, but yeah, this is another paper I mentioned in the work, Aldiri et al. 2021. Um, and then there was this one based on the robustness of indicators did with Professor Drago as well. And this one with Busato, um, so several publications. This was Journal of Clean Production. Um, then to reply to additional questions. Um, so 
of course, to, to, to conclude to the first questions, yeah, so maybe in, in the last years, many changes have occurred, so probably we have a different data and also the source is different. Mm -hmm. So these are mostly World Bank and partners data. Uh, there were improvements in uh, China focus in the last version. I'm not sure you uh, got it because in the first version it's true that the role of China was less evident, but this uh, called us for, called for shrinking the literature review because of course we cannot presented 20,000 words paper. Uh, uh, but there is some literature. The problem, um, Dr. Yao, is that there are not many papers on this topic. So on energy resilience in China, let's say energy transition, okay? Yes, but energy transition, resilience, sustainable development, and using a composite metric, no, not many. And this is worldwide, not all in China. Yes, please question on the floor no 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 i, just, I was just going to say that it's it's probably because it's a fairly sensitive topic i would imagine well, if you also enlarge of course i was <laughs> kidding but uh, if you enlarge uh, the perspective is no there are not many papers on composite indicators of this type mm -hmm. so um then you asked about comparison so the term of is worldwide. So we picked uh, in the paper, we picked um, some samples. I think we analyzed many countries from Eastern Asia, South Asia, and we also analyzed uh, the US, some countries in Europe, some countries in Africa, and worldwide countries. Okay. So uh, basically, it's a worldwide comparison. Uh, theoretical contribution, yes, as I mentioned, uh, for instance, the energy access definition, you asked for this kind of things. Uh, we didn't really repeat all the time this because this would have taken a lot, a lot of words. Uh, we relied on existing papers, including the one we published on ecological economics, but also on other papers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready. Yeah. Dr. Gatto, I think we need to kick on with the discussion because I think we've got the point ah, that okay. uh, there's so no, I don't mean to shut you down, but I think we could expand on this a yeah. little bit. Um, I could just mm -hmm. share my experiences. Uh, a number of years ago, I was in Beijing and I went to one agency in the mm. morning and then I went to another agency in the afternoon and I got diametrically opposed data. Um, and I don't think it because I didn't, I don't think it was because I asked the wrong way, but it may well have been. But I think. Um, this issue with data transparency and data availability, um, especially in countries in a time of, you know, let's be very, very, very blunt, a, ge a geopolitical uncertainty, people are a little bit nervous about sharing things which might have a direct implication on their relative strengths. Um, I wanted to just make two comments on your table four indicator four for planning for RE expansion. Um, China ranks really low on that, but they've been very successful at it. Do you think that's because they're not communicating? They perhaps could not, but haven't communicated that as well. I'd be really interested, Dr. Zhao and Dr. Gatto, for your views. That I think is a at the crux of the argument. Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, this is a good point. Uh, you know, if you want to analyze each single variable, it's one paper each variable. So there are twenty-seven variables. <laughs> so this is uh, obviously a very a very insightful comment. Yes, thanks for pointing out. Probably yes, I think so. But maybe Dr. Yao has another perspective on this. Sorry to and put I you also... on the spot, Dr. Yao. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. And also Gato, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I also had a comment on data availability. So one of these papers I mentioned before, yeah, in base also mentioned this problem. So there is a problem. There are papers we mentioned uh, in several works, including a critique to the RISE database, to the WDI, World Development Indicators database. And recently I published another paper on energy uh, research and social science that is uh, criticizing the Eurobarometer for the typology of 
questions and methodology. And this is the European Union. So when we run the energy vulnerability index, we noticed that many countries, even in uh, Africa, where we knew that they had high vulnerability were like eh, declaring something else. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, we are not uh, inventing anything new, you know, it's, it's okay. a consolidated problem, but I mean, we have to run analysis. We, in order to avoid this, we can only try to create more robust indicators. This is the only solution. If and, I could, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and the source is fundamental. So if the World Bank, as this data, probably these are the best available data, but then, you know, it, it's tricky. It's not that immediate, you know. Okay, we've run out of time. Dr. Jao, thank you very much. I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to speak more because I'm, we would have been very interested to hear your views. But uh, to recap, um, uh, China has been very successful in its uh, progress. Uh, and there are obviously, uh, perhaps the data as we've had in this discussion, doesn't bear that out as perhaps might it should. So on that level, I think we can round that off. The next, uh, my understanding, the next session is just going to recap and let people ask their questions or have any comments who would like. Dina, is that correct? We've got another 10 minutes of commentary or we got to shut down? No, we, we can still discuss this paper q &A. Well, I think, do you want to talk to some wider issues in this, this next discussion, which have come out of this uh, today? Does anybody have any comments they'd like to make? If they'd like to raise their hand, we'd be very happy to hear from them. Uh, maybe I start with the question. Uh, Please, go ahead. Opportunity. Thanks, Stefan, for excellent moderation. Uh, so, Andrea, actually, uh, I was surprised that uh, Yisin mentioned in her discussion that your paper saying that China is a good example for energy access, but not for renewable energy and energy efficiency. I was surprised because China is like top investor in renewable energy. So, why is that? Thank you. Uh, well, Thank you for your question. First of all, probably depends on the variable. And second, it takes time to change, you know, uh, the different rankings, especially if compared to countries like Denmark, Sweden, you know, Canada, not that easy. Yeah? So regionally, it's still very good. As we can see, well, from that table, we, we cannot see this. Uh, but if you go through the paper, uh, there are made a lot of comparisons. So regionally, in the vast majority of variables, China is the leader, hmm? is the regional leader. But when it comes to global comparisons, not always, hmm? as you can see from the ranks of the year. And then again, I mean, things are changing rapidly in China, uh, you know. <laughs> as you were mentioning, as Dr. Zhao was mentioning, but this is not a bad result, huh? This is 2016. You see how dark is China, no? <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or any comments or anything they'd like to raise? Just raise your hand. Okay, so Dina, do you mind if I uh, round off? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Stefan, for excellent moderation, and thanks to all presenters and discussants. This was a wonderful day, day two of the three-day event. So please um, join us tomorrow. Tomorrow's session is afternoon, and we'll have two keynote speeches from Kazakhstan and Indonesia, um, and uh, session five on also on energy transition in China, Indonesia, and Philippines. So we great, uh, we got very good countries. Uh, which I think energy transition important for these countries. Um, so many thanks for everyone for your um, excellent contribution and see you.